Good morning, everyone. I'm Laura Whitlock, the Marketing Manager for Watson Gloves, and thank you all for joining us today on our webinar on preparing for the new glove impact standards, what you need to know about ANSI IFCA 138. I also want to welcome our two presenters today. We have Rodney and Christina. Rodney Taylor is the Global PPE Sales and Marketing Manager at D3O. Rodney was just appointed to the Board of Directors of the International Glove Association, so congratulations to you, Rodney. Our second present presenter today is Christina Young, who's in charge of product creation and development at Watson Gloves. And the agenda for today includes Rodney will present on the new impact standards, and then we'll have Christina do an overview of our new uh, impact gloves that we're excited to launch um, in 2019. And then finally, we'll have a Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them into the question box on your dashboard, and we'll be able to answer a few of the questions at the end of the session. Great, so let's get started. Okay. All right, Rodney, you can begin. Okay, great. Asking the slide to advance here. Well, while that's happening, I just wanna say um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who is on the call. Uh, really excited to be speaking with you today and to provide an overview of the new and emerging ISEA uh, 138 impact standard. Also, just want to say that uh, very, very pleased to be collaborating commercially with Watson Glove. Watson brings a long-standing legacy of quality and innovation into the glove market and uh, really are just great commercial partners. So thank you, Watson, for allowing us this opportunity. This chart shows uh, the agenda for this, this, for this uh, discussion. And uh, really quite simply, we'll start off talking very briefly about the overall problem that exists in the glove market with regard to backup hand impact protection, transitioned into talking about the solution, and then getting into the nitty gritty of how the standard works. We'll talk about the requirements of the standard. We'll give an overview of the testing method that's, that incorpor that's incorporated in the standard. And then we'll close out uh, with a summary and a dis brief discussion about additional resources that are available. All right, so uh, let's kind of get things kicked off by talking about the problem. And uh, what I'm gonna share here is, is probably something that many of you have seen before, but really just want to underscore the reality that exists in the glove market. And the first component of that reality is that hands are frequently injured, hands are vulnerable to, to injury. As this chart indicates, almost half of all recordable incidents involve the hand, uh, the fingers, or the wrist. So a significant number of injuries um, that the hands occur for industrial workers. And then this next chart talks about the, the, the real cost associated with that number of injuries. Hand injuries lead to lost time. And in addition, a large percentage of uh, hand injury causes are actually impact related. You know, we tend to think about hand injuries being associated with cut and slash, but uh, there is emerging data that's coming out specifically in markets like oil and gas, where the International Association of Drilling Contractors is estimating that a large number of the hand injury causes are actually related to impact versus cut and slash. So in the next chart here, um, just kind of summarize the problem that exists. We've established the reality of the high frequency of hand injuries. Um, another major issue for those who have the responsibility for specifying appropriate PPE is just a huge influx of new gloves that are entering into the market. We just see new gloves coming out pretty much every month. This is a reality for, for all types of gloves, but it's definitely an issue for impact protective gloves. You combine these realities with the fact that end users don't really have any straightforward or reliable means to make objective comparisons between different products on the market, and the result is really a challenge for specifiers. The real question for them is, what's the measuring stick that a specifier should be using to compare different gloves. You have all these different gloves on the market either making no performance claims or presenting their performance claims in different ways. How do you know which product is right for your application needs? And the burden of that uncertainty is absolutely, absolutely tremendous. I have a great deal of respect for specifiers, people who do this job every day, 
and, a, and specify appropriate PPE for their workers because it, it is not an easy job. So clearly, clearly a solution is needed. And so let's transition now to talk a little bit about that solution. All right. So uh, impact performance standard, there really, as I've already stated, no, per no performance standards in place in North America for dorsal impact protection on industrial gloves. There is an industrial glove standard um, in Europe. EN388 does have an impact assessment, which includes knuckle testing. It, it excludes the fingers, but it does include knuckle testing. And it does provide a pass-fail threshold uh, for impact protection. There is an, an existing industrial glove standard in North America, which is ANSI ISCA 105, but that standard focuses primarily on cut slash assessment and does not include any type of impact assessment. So it's, it's, it's good that there is a, a European standard that exists, but the reality is for end users in North America, European standards typically are not followed in North America. The primary standards development organization in North America is the International Safety Equipment Association. So just a, a quick update on the ISCA for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, the ISCA is a nonprofit trade association that is composed of manufacturers of personal protective equipment and other, and other types of safety equipment. Uh, the members include over 100 different companies who are represented within the membership base of the ISCA. And in addition, the ISCA is a secretariat organization for several American National Standards Institute, or, or ANSI, uh, technical standards for products as varied as high visibility clothing, eye protection, hard hats, chemical and dust protection, hand protection, and others. And this secretariat role was formally held by the American Society of Safety Engineers, which is an organization that many of you may be familiar with. So as we set off to start thinking about building a new standard, um, we worked very collaboratively with the ISCA and their uh, longstanding um, hand protection committee. The ISCA has several standing product groups, kind of think of these as committees, and they focus on a variety of different application areas such as emergency eye wash, eye and face protection, fall protection, first aid, hand protection, head protection, hearing protection, high visibility, uh, protective apparel, and respiratory protection. So within the hand protection committee or hand protection group within the ISCA, there was a separate independent work group that was formed that focused exclusively on developing a new dorsal impact standard for industrial gloves. There were seven member companies who participated. Uh, and in addition, we were able to uh, garner uh, input from a professional hand surgeon who was extremely helpful in helping us think through the requirements and helping us build out this new standard. The companies who participated in the work group are listed on this slide, and D3O served as the chair of the work group. All right, so let's get into the details about exactly how this new standard works. Before I do that, I just want to say that uh, D3O has been heavily involved uh, around with, with industrial uh, safety standards. Um, I've got a listing there of the different organizations that we have worked with, but uh, very intimately involved in, in standards development and standards application. So let's talk now about the, the components of this new standard. So a couple of key messages. I am not going to be able to give you every detail of the standard in the short amount of time that we have to, together today, but I do want to focus on some key components of the standard, which are, one, this is a standalone standard. As I said, there is already a hand protection standard that exists in North America, which is ANSI ISCA 105. Um, this will be an independent standard. The designator is ANSI ISCA 138 completely independent of ANSI ISCA 105. There is some discussion that's already taking place of potentially rolling this standard into 105 at some point, possibly during the next revision cycle for the 105 standard, but that's yet to be determined. Until then, it will be a standalone standard. The next component is uh, there will be an impact test method, 
and uh, peak transmitted force will be the ultimate assessment of impact performance. I'll talk more about that very shortly. And another key component is that testing is to be conducted by an independent ISO 17025 certified lab. From, from a performance assessment standpoint, both fingers and knuckles are required to be tested under this new standard. And the lowest performing area of the glove defines the overall performance of the glove. Unlike EAM388, where there is a pass-fail requirement, this new standard will have multiple performance levels. The, the performance will be based on evaluating gloves themselves. And overall, the assessment is based on an improvement over a standard leather driver glove. And then the other major component is that there is a pictogram mark that is going to be required on the glove. And we'll talk in more detail about that in just a second. So in this chart, um, I want to get into a little bit in talking about the impact test method. Um, I'm trained as an engineer, so I know that impacts represent very complex engineering problems. And uh, I think this video gives us some hints as to why. There is a lot happening in a very short period of time in an impact scenario. This particular video was captured at 70,000 frames per second. It shows a, a ball being shot out of a gun and traveling at 150 miles per hour and hitting a steel plate. It's pretty amazing to see what's taking place in that dynamic scenario. So you think about that, just as an example, how do you make sure that you are appropriately capturing what's happening at, at, at an impact? So what I want to do here on this chart is talk a little bit more about the mechanics of impacts. So let's start off kind of imagining, looking at this box here. So, so let's imagine that we have a rigid object that's represented by this square that's dropped. And as it drops, it impacts an elastic material. If you were to record all the forces that were taking place during this scenario, what you would get is a curve that looks very similar to the curve that you see at the bottom of this chart. You see that um, as the object falls in, and impacts the elastic object, you see that forces would rise and ultimately peak as the uh, elastic material kind of bottoms out, as it reaches its elastic limit. And then as it recovers, you see that uh, the forces would, would trail off from that peak. So the peak of this curve we refer to as the peak transmitted force, and it represents the amount of energy that's absorbed by the test material, the material that's being impacted. The more energy that's absorbed by the test material, the lower um, the peak of this curve. In other words, if you're measuring forces at the base here, the maximum amount of energy gives you an indication of how much energy has been absorbed by the material. And so why is that important? It's important because if you're trying to compare the impact performance of two different materials, the material that's going to have the lower peak transmitted force will have absorbed more energy. And that's what you want. So you think about this from now, let's take this back to the real world setting, thinking about industrial gloves that are going to be protecting our workers' hands. You want the material that's on the back of the glove to absorb as much energy as possible, such that that energy does not make its way to the worker's hands. So the key message here is when we're doing this analytical testing, the lower peak transmitted force is better. So keep that in mind, lower is, is better when we're doing impact testing. So on this next chart, what I'm showing is the actual analytical test rig that's used to do this type of impact testing. There are a variety of, the, of manufacturers of these rigs. This just happens to be the uh, rig that we use in our lab and our headquarters in London. But these analytical test rigs are designed to very accurately measure forces during an impact. So let's just walk quickly through the components of this test rig. The first component is the carriage. So this entire assembly here that's, that's highlighted as the carriage, that is dropped from a set height. So the combination of weight and height provides a specific amount of impact energy to the glove specimen. And you'll notice that uh, item number two here uh, is the striker. So there is a striker with a very specified geometry. 
that impacts the glove specimen, and the glove specimen sits on a curved anvil. And at the bottom of all of this apparatus is a very precise force measuring device that's called a load cell. And that load cell records all the forces throughout the impact. Those forces are then captured electronically. And the performance, as we said on the previous chart, the performance of the glove specimen is determined by the maximum, maximum or peak force. So just to show you this uh, testing in action, there's just a short video that shows how this works. All right. So let's move on now and get into a little bit more detail and talk about actual performance assessment. As stated before, the weakest performance area of the glove defines the overall performance level of the glove. So we're testing both fingers and thumb as well as knuckles. So what that means is if the performance of the fingers is lower than the performance of the knuckles, then the performance of the fingers will determine the overall performance of the glove. And so for a given uh, test uh, suite, there'll be 10 impacts for the finger and the thumb uh, and eight impacts for the knuckle. And then this chart specifies exactly where the impact locations are on the finger, as well as where the impact locations are on the knuckle. I will say that uh, it's important to note that the knuckle locations are identified by having a wearer don a glove and then grasp a bar, a 32 millimeter bar, and then mark specific knuckle locations on the glove specimen itself. And the reason that we did this is because we have seen that there are some gloves that are sold in the market that have backup hand impact protection that actually don't cover the knuckles when grasping the bar. So we wanted to make sure that um, clearly um, we were testing exactly where the knuckles were located, irrespective of where the protection was on the glove. All right, so the next chart here talks about the actual performance levels in the standard. So as we stated, there are three performance levels, and the levels are defined by both the average and peak transmitted force measurements. So there is a combination of both the average of test results, but there's also a component that says that uh, you can't have any single impact result that's higher than a specific level. So really trying to capture both kind of, in a sense, the mean and the standard deviation. There are marking requirements under this new standard. So uh, once the testing is completed, uh, the performance level of the impact resistance uh, has to be noted using a very specific pictogram marking. Uh, the, each of the pictogram level markings are listed here on this chart. And the other requirements here is that it has to be visible and legible throughout the useful life, life of the glove and, and permanently marked on the glove. And I think it's important to highlight this chart because this is really rather unique for North America standards. And overall, it's intended to provide as much clarity to end users uh, to support uh, them in their glove selection process. All right, so in summary, uh, just kind of get, first, I want to just give an, an update on where the, the, the standard is in its overall development and publication. The first important piece is that this standard is not finalized. It has not been published as of yet. Uh, the work group has really completed the bulk of its work in drafting the standard, but there are a variety of other internal uh, processes that have to take place, take place both within the ISCA as well as within ANSI. Uh, those uh, processes are underway right now. We are currently expecting that the standard should be published by uh, Q4 of this year uh, as uh, we continue to move through the remaining uh, processes. And as stated before, uh, this will be an independent standalone standard. Uh, there, there is potential at this point for there to be additional changes to the standard uh, as uh, there's external review of the standards, so please keep an eye out for any updates from the ISCA with regard to this standard. You are definitely getting a sneak peek today. Uh, we expect that the major components of the standard will not change at publication, uh, but that there, there will probably be some minor changes that, that take place. So in summary, 
The improvements that we made is that uh, there are now multiple performance levels in place to assess the performance of, of dorsal impact gloves. Uh, the standard does include both knuckle and finger evaluation instead of just finger evaluation as is done in the European EN 388 standard. And there is a requirement for external lab certification as well as a requirement for pictogram marking on the gloves. So with that, we'll just say that um, we are, I'll be standing by at the conclusion of the uh, webinar to answer any specific questions that you might have with regard to the ANSI ISCA 138 standard. So now I just wanted to share just some resources that uh, are available to you. Uh, you'll be able to get access to this presentation at the conclusion of the webinar. And on this particular slide, there are hyperlinks here to a variety of different articles and publications uh, that have been created. Uh, some of these are published in major trade magazines. Some of these are, are created um, internally by D3O. So you can just click on these links here and be able to get access uh, to these articles that talk in more detail about the ANSI ISCA 138 standard. There's also an interesting guide to impact energies. Uh, you start talking about impact energy and uh, the, the engineers get excited and everyone else kind of falls asleep. So uh, we try to make, uh, make this uh, more meaningful to lay people with regard to what we're talking about when we talk about specific impact energies. All right, so I think I've covered uh, all these key messages here. The new standard is coming. We expect publication uh, Q4 of this year. We've talked about the different components of the standard. We've talked about the fact that the drop rig is the accepted test method and that Drop rig testing will be done by independent labs. Please keep in mind as uh, the standard is published and you start utilizing this standard that lower peak transmitted force is better. That's a bit counterintuitive. We're typically used to seeing higher being better. So just keep in mind, lower is better. We want the lowest possible force possible. And uh, the other key message is that we are here to help. Uh, D3O, we are industry leaders in impact protection. We have a range of products for dorsal impact protection. We were also very heavily involved in the development of this standard. So uh, any questions that you have, feel free to reach out to us. We would be glad to help you out. All right, so just um, wanna close out and share just a couple of messages about D3O and our technologies. Uh, we have proven ourselves to be the leaders in impact protection across a variety of different environments. Uh, this chart shows the key focus areas, the key markets that we serve. And uh, everything that we've learned in these various market segments, we leverage across all of them. We do have a global presence with our primary headquarters in London. We have uh, North America headquarters in Blacksburg, Virginia, on the uh, campus of Virginia Tech and their corporate research center, as well as our testing quality and uh, production facilities in Asia. And just a little bit about how D3O works. Um, D3O is based on a very unique dilatant technology that allows our materials to be soft and flexible in their natural state, but to stiffen instantly upon impact to absorb and dissipate energy. And then afterwards, after that energy is, uh, is, is removed, the material returns back to its original flexible state. So really a unique technology Unique in two ways, one that no one else has the know-how or experience to integrate our dilatants into a polymer structure, as well as we have significant IP protection on our technology. We offer a portfolio of products for industrial glove applications, including both knuckle and finger parts. Traditionally, we have supplied finished parts to OEM manufacturers, but our latest offering is called Impact Additive. And very soon, Christina is gonna be sharing with you some new products that Watson Glove has developed that are leveraging that new impact added technology. The majority of the market is using what's called thermoplastic rubber or TPR for backup and protection. D3O has developed an additive that is applied to an OEM's existing TPR plastisol formulation. So what happens is the impact additive is added at about a 10% per volume basis to the solution of TPR. And for that, the finished TPR will see a significant improvement in impact performance. And so with that, I am going to uh, hand it back over 
to you, Laura and Christine, to, uh, for the next component of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rodney. That was an awesome presentation, um, super informational, and um, it's great to be able to give everyone a sneak peek of uh, what's coming down the pipeline in terms of the impact standard. Um, and before I get started, um, I'd actually like to take a minute to thank uh, you, Rodney, and the D3O team for all of your support this past year. Um, Laura and I attended the NSC last year, and when we visited your booth and saw that you were launching this impact additive, we were very excited to get on board. And uh, since then, we've been working very closely with uh, the D3O team to develop the gloves that use the D3O um, impact additive technology to enhance the TPR and our, um, to enhance the impact resistance in our components. So as of today, we're very proud to say that Watson Gloves will be the first to market in Canada with work gloves that have the D3O impact additive TPR back of hand protection. So what we are about to share with you is a sneak peek of these gloves, um, and these will be launching in the spring of 2019. All of these uh, styles are also currently available for pre-booking. So the first glove we have here is our 5785 Shock Trooper. Um, this glove is fully lined with our cut shield fabric. And the fabric is made of a blend of paraeramide steel and motocrylic fibers. This blend will not only give you a um, high cut resistance, but also has excellent flame resistant properties as well. The exterior of this glove uses our dry hide liquid resistant full grain goatskin leather. The dry hide leather is actually treated at the tanning um, process to withstand penetration from both oil and water. And of course, we use goat skin because of its excellent abrasion resistance and wearability. The back of the hand is loaded with our D3O uh, impact additive TPR components, and we have them on the fingers, the knuckles, um, including the back of hand, the wrist area, and the top of thumb. The components, although they look um, heavy, are actually quite flexible and are actually quite lightweight and soft. And the D3O impact additive will help um, the components actually improve the impact resistance um, versus regular TPR at the, at the same thickness. So we're really excited to be um, launching this new technology in our gloves. And once the um, ISDA 138 impact standard is published, we anticipate that this glove will pass at an ANSI level two, impact ANSI level two. This glove also, um, as a whole, will um, pass at an ANSI level 8, A8 cut resistance. So for the next glove, um, we have our 5785G Shock Trooper Gauntlet. So this glove celebrates the same features um, as our driver version with the full sock cut resistant um, cut shield liner, the dry high liquid liquid resistant goat skin leather and the D3O IA uh, TPR components. We do have the vibration dampening um, uh, palm patch as well. And um, we also have added um, wrist protection. So on the previous uh, glove and this glove, we've added additional protection in the wrist area. We feel that the wrist area is a very vulnerable part of the hand that is often neglected in hand protection. So we wanted to make sure that for our new styles, we are addressing um, that concern as well. The third glove that we have in our lineup is our 5782CRD. This is um, taking our well-known Stormtrooper glove and really taking it to the next level. This glove um, uh, features our signature soft and flexible deerskin back of hand, our dry hide oil and water resistant cowhide palm, and has fully loaded D3O um, impact additive TPR components on the back of hand and top of thumb. It also has a three inch split leather cuff with a uh, reflective 3M reflective strip, and is also fully lined from the fingertip all the way to the cuff opening with our ANSI A4 cut shield lining. 
we're very proud of this glove because we actually manufacture it in our um, Canadian uh, factory here in our Burnaby head office. The next glove we have is our 585 Commander. This is the final glove in our series that uses a D3O-IA. Um, this glove is perfect for applications where impact resistance is still required, but perhaps not um, the cut resistance. So the Commander has a flexible camo print spandex back, a dry fiber liquid resistant um, material on the palm, and is fully um, loaded on the back of the hand, top of thumb and wrist with the D3O impact additive uh, TPR components. It also has a high abrasion resistant material on the padded palm and as well in the thumb saddle area, which are um, high abrasion areas as well. So in the past, few slides, you would have noticed, uh, you may have noticed that we have um, the Wounded Warriors logo um, at the bottom. And uh, we're very proud to announce um, that we've recently partnered with the Wounded Warriors of Canada for the launch of these new gloves. Um, and we're just going to really quickly share with you a video that tells you more about our partnership with them. Watson Gloves was founded in 1918, near the end of the First World War, a very challenging time indeed. 20 years later, my grandfather assumed the company, right at the outbreak of the Second World War. A lot of Canadian manufacturers and infrastructure projects were cancelled, and a lot of businesses did not make it during these times. Fortunately, all the manufacturers for war needed material, including ships, planes, munitions, and tanks all needed good quality gloves. Watson Gloves was there to fill the need. A hundred years later, Watson Gloves remembers. We remember the women and men who served so bravely for our country. We feel it is important for Watson Gloves to give back to the brave men and women who have served us in the past, continue to serve us in frontline duties, paramedics, firefighters, police, and the brave men and women who are still serving overseas in conflicts. Show our support for the noble men and women who have served us in the past and those that continue to serve us today. Watson Gloves will be tripping 50 cents a pair of our new line of gloves, Shaw Cooper and Commander, to the noble cause of Wounded Warriors of Canada. We thank all of you who make our lives safe and protect us. Thank you. Wounded Warriors Canada is a national mental health charity that supports our ill and injured members of the Canadian Armed Forces, veterans, first responders and their families. As a national mental health charity that's privately funded, 100% of our donations come from Canadians and Canadian businesses from across the country. Partnerships make our programs possible. Partnerships are the reason we're able to transform and change and save lives and families. And that's why we're so thankful for the support of Watson Gloves. We thank Watson Gloves for joining our mission, getting in this together for mental health, and helping us make a difference for those who serve Canada at home and abroad. As you can see, um, Watson Gloves is very committed to donating um, part of our proceeds from the sale of both the Shock Trooper and Commander um, to the Watson or to the Wounded Warriors of Canada, um, as we are really proud to give back to all of those who have served and are still currently serving um, on the front lines. And um, Great. The, sorry, go ahead, Laura. So that concludes our webinar for today. We do have um, some time for answer, answer any of your questions. So again, if you have any questions, please enter them into your question box on your dashboard. And we'll just take a look here to see. So one of the questions that we have here, um, Rodney, is um, what is a standalone standard? What does that mean? Yeah, what that means is that um, ANSI ISCA 138 uh, will be published uh, on its own. So uh, the actual title of the standard um, is really about performance and classification for impact resistant hand protection. <clears throat> and so I want to make that distinction because there are other hand protection standards that are available today. And the one that most folks in the industry are familiar with is ANSI ISCA 105, 
which is really focused primarily on um, cut, puncture, and chemical protection. So I want to make it clear to folks that when you start going out and looking for you know, the, the latest hand protection standard, that you're not looking at 105, that you are looking for 138. It, it, it is its own independent standard. Still, still published under the ISCA and ANSI. Okay, thanks, Rodney. Another question here, Rodney. What is the impact level measured in psi? Also, yeah. once the standards are finalized, do you think Europe will adopt these standards? Yeah, good question. Uh, as far as uh, how the the impact is measured, it's measuring force. And the the uh, the units for force are kilonewtons. So it's it's using uh, European Force Measurement System uh, metric. Think of it the metric system, which uh, uses newtons as the measure of force. So thousands of newtons essentially is the the measure of force. As far as the question is around uh, whether or not um, the European standards organizations will adopt um, the components of ANSI ICA 138, um, that's an unknown. Um, I'm, I'm sh they will be aware of what we're doing, and, and hopefully, the hope is that they will see the changes that we've made to be improvements potentially to uh, EN 388 and be willing to adopt uh, those components. But uh, we will have to see. Okay, the next question here for Rodney. If the publication comes out in Q4 2018, when will manufacturers be required to test and meet the standard? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, unlike Europe, um, where there can be some governmental oversight and um, some, some, some requirements by the government to adopt particular uh, performance standards, in North America, standards are voluntary. So there is really no entity that exists that is going to require that any manufacturer comply with the standard or any end user for that matter comply with the standard. It's a, it's a voluntary compliance infrastructure that exists in North America. So it's really a function of how quickly uh, end users really start to begin to demand product that's compliant with the new ANSI ICA 138 standard. So there's a lot of onus on end users like you folks who are on the call today to go to your distributors and say, hey, I want gloves that meet the requirements of ANSI ICA 138. Talk to any manufacturers that you have relationships with and say, I need gloves that are compliant with ANSI ICA 138. Um, many others, uh, you know, Watson is already ahead of the curve and starting to develop products right now that are going to meet those requirements. So they have, as uh, Christine has just shared, they have a full, whole portfolio of products already that's been developed that will meet the requirements of ANSI ICA 138. Great. Okay, let's see if any other questions come in now. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining our webinar today. Uh, we have attached the program on our new product, and we'll also be sending out a white paper on uh, the impact, new impact standards that Rodney just presented on. We are, as Christina mentioned, pre-booking our shock trooper and our storm trooper gloves now. And I just want to thank you all again um, for joining us today. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Rodney. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Thank you.